Today we hear a favorite story that has become emblematic of the Christian faith, and you can hear why. When a man is lying on the side of the road, beaten and half dead, two respected members of society each come upon him. They each see him and they each make the choice to cross the street and walk by on the other side. But the third man, the third man is moved by compassion. The Bible says he is gripped in his guts. And this third man stops and helps. Now we know this story and we love this story and there is no missing its motive. This warm, smiling Sunday school parable gently sets the question ringing in our conscience. So what would you do if it were you who came upon the man lying beside the road? What would you do? And as long as it's just a warm, smiling thought experiment, you know, just a friendly Bible story, what could go wrong? But that's just it. We know how to give the right answer, but this time, if you keep your eye on the story's conceptual instruction, you know, what it is we're supposed to be learning, just keep your eye on that because whoosh, Jesus flips it around in the, and catches it in the air. And it turns out, it's not just what you know, it's what you do. It's the tremble in our conscience where our knowing spills into our doing and we have to act. But it also goes the other way too. What if our actions have the power to unsettle our understanding? What if the work of our hands could actually change what we believe? I will tell you, when it comes to stopping and helping, I am no expert at this. I win no prizes, but it's also true that just about everything I've learned about stopping and helping, I have learned from the church. In all of our work of caring and serving, in every card written to somebody who's grieving, in every prayer for somebody in prison, in every donation of diapers or money or masks, do you realize what we are actually doing? Because it's true that we are trying to translate the work of Christ into the work of our hands. That's absolutely it. And it's true that we are trying to help someone who's in need. And it's also true that we are training. We're establishing the neural pathways in our own brains that sharpen our reflexes for stopping and helping. It's building muscle memory so every act of kindness makes the next, the next act of kindness that much more possible. Something they would tell us in CPR training, and I hope they are right about this for your sake and mine, and I think they are, they would tell us, don't worry. You don't have to go home and study the CPR handouts for hours every evening. Once you've absorbed the basic theory and then practiced it a few times in your body, it will be there for you when you need it. If there's a real emergency, your adrenaline will kick in and you will know what to do. This is what we are training for. And it's kind of the same thing with the church. It flows both ways, so our knowledge spills into our action, 
But it's also the case that our action influences our knowledge. It's all important. It's all beautiful. And we love that. It's just, there might be a real risk in play. And in case nobody's warned you, somebody should. What if the work of caring and serving, the work that lives at the heart of our church, what if this is putting us at risk of developing a more dangerous faith? Because it might be. Now today, the scripture that Georgia read begins when a lawyer asks Jesus a question. Tell me, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Or how can I live again? Or how can I come back to life? You're a lawyer, says the Lord. What does the law say? And without missing a beat, the man knows the right answer. He says to love the Lord our God with everything we are, with everything we've got, and to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And once he says that, Jesus smiles at him and gives him the A-plus gold star, and that should have been the end of our story. But the lawyer is afraid. It turns out his question wasn't hypothetical after all. There is a tremble in his voice. Please, he says to the Lord, tell me, how am I supposed to do this? Because it's one thing to know that we want to come back to life. It's another thing entirely to be able to do that. It's one thing to know that we should love our neighbors. Of course, that's what we learn in Sunday school. It is right there in the law. But how exactly do we do this? It's one thing to know that Jesus teaches us to love our enemies. There is no getting around it. That is a resplendent gem in the heart of our Christian faith. But oh, my friends, it's one thing to appreciate this as a thought experiment, to know that we should love our enemies. Of course, that's the right answer. Actually doing this is another matter entirely. And I've shared this with you before, and I probably will be sharing it with you many times in the future because I love this. When I worked in a transitional home for women recovering from addiction and homelessness, our program director, Faye, used to say this whenever a conflict arose in the house, which was often. She would say, the sister you hate the most is going to be the sister who saves your life. <laughs> I know. I know if that sounds ridiculous to you, you are not wrong. But there are just a couple of things to notice about what she said. First, Faye did not issue this as an imperative. She did not say, you better not hate the other women in the house. No. The first thing I love is that Faye said this with all the matter-of-fact authority of somebody who says, look, the soup you put uncovered into the microwave is soup you're going to be cleaning off its ceiling. Just see if I'm wrong. And the second thing I love is that ever since I heard this from Faye, in my own life, it keeps proving to be true. Inevitably, the people who rub me the wrong way are exactly the people who show up when I most need help. Now, you might still be unconvinced about this saying, and that's totally fine. But all I'm saying is it really could happen to you. The person who gets on your last nerve the person who you find most offensive 
don't be surprised if the day comes when they save your life. Just see if we're wrong. So here we have a lawyer standing before Jesus with a tremble in his voice asking, how can I actually do this? This loving my neighbor, this coming back to life. And this is when Jesus tells the story that answers his problem by making it worse. So say you were leaving the temple on your way to Jericho when a band of robbers attacks you and takes everything and nearly kills you. All right, that is quite a way to start a story, but okay, here we go. Well, now a priest comes by and you think, oh good, he might stop and help me. But no, when he sees you, he crosses the street. Next, a Levite approaches and he does the same thing, just walks right by on the other side. But then a Samaritan comes upon you. And once Jesus said that word, the whole crowd shuddered. We might remember there is tension between the Samaritan people and the Jewish people. If you were at church on Ash Wednesday, you might remember the Samaritan village refused to let Jesus and the disciples spend the night. So Jesus looked at this lawyer and loved the lawyer and tells him, the Samaritan stops and helps you. He pours wine into your wounds. He pours mercy into your trauma. And that's just it. Mercy is how you come back to life. Now, what are you going to do? Here's the thing. Jesus does not say you will get saved by a kind hearted passerby. That's often how we tell the story, but it's much more threatening than that. Jesus is telling this poor lawyer, you want to live? Your life is going to get saved by exactly the person you hate the most, by the sister or brother you just can't stand. And this time, when the lawyer gives the right answer, when he admits the Samaritan is his neighbor. Jesus does not give him the A plus gold star. Jesus says to the lawyer and to all of us who can hear, right, now that you know, what are you going to do? Our knowing spills into our doing and our doing spills into our knowing. And what if we are at real risk of coming back to life? What if the work of the church is putting our faith at risk of becoming far more dangerous and daring? We know that the grace of God is the very power of salvation. And do you realize that we are handling this grace all the time? We are handling it and we're not even wearing gloves. And I cannot protect you from its effects. It will get into our system. And so you know how it goes. You come to the food pantry some Saturday morning and you might find yourself putting bags of groceries into the trunk of a car of a white man who is proud to be white. You catch a glimpse of what's on his t-shirt and it chills your blood. Then he looks at you and he tells you he just lost his job. And he says, you have no idea what a blessing this is. And when he says that, tears prickle in his eyes. And wouldn't you know, now tears are prickling in your eyes too. Or maybe this happens. You go to drop off a meal to a person who's homebound, but you know what they say about no good deed. 
So you turned on the side street only to find that the plow has not been through. You do that thing where you give it some gas and put it in reverse and give it some gas and put it in reverse and try to inch back and forth, but it's no use. Your wheels are spinning. And that's when a man and a woman come out from the garage across the street. She has got a shovel. He is bringing kitty litter. And as they're walking towards you, you see the car that's parked in their driveway. It is sporting a bumper sticker for the church in town that is proudly anti-gay. Of all the people to come to your rescue, You think to yourself, oh, they better not start talking to me about Jesus, but they don't. They smile and dig out your tires and then they go and push your car while you give it gas and now you are free. In case nobody has warned you, somebody should. If we are going to do the work of caring and serving, if we are really gonna take that on as a serious commitment, which we have, we just might find that our own hate becomes destabilized. Our enemies start to look like our neighbors and our neighbors start to look like the ones we love. And it could be, this is what the kingdom of God looks like. Could be this is what coming back to life looks like. If we are doing it right, the work of the church will ask us to save the life of somebody we are supposed to hate. And I know. But just wait until you see who has come to save your life. Oh, hallelujah. Amen.